Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this very special conversation about addressing uh, systemic racism in Canada's screen industries. I want to thank you for taking the time to be here. Uh, we've got uh, a really great group of people who are leading uh, just about all of Canada's national screen institutions, and we want to talk about racism within institutions and what we can all do to address it. Um, we want to be as effective as possible in this conversation, so we're going to try to really make it a, a great exchange rather than have a, a whole lot of long speeches. And to help us do that, we have a great moderator, Amanda Paris, uh, who is a broadcaster, a playwright, a writer, a journalist, and someone who uh, has uh, already shown for many years her understanding of these issues and her ability to hold people's feet to the fire. So that's what we're here for. Over to you, Amanda. Thanks so much. Uh, welcome everybody to this talk today. I'm very excited about it and I'm very thankful to everyone that has agreed to join it. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a rundown as to how everything is going to go. Each of the guests today are going to present for three minutes uh, a little bit about the commitments and the direction that their institution is taking to address systemic racism. Um, and then after that, I'll follow up with a question potentially. And then after each of those present, after all of those presentations are concluded, we'll open it up for a Q&A. That, for that Q&A, um, I'm gonna ask that you send your questions to the TIFF Q&A box, which you should be able to see in your grid if you have not already sent your questions in advance. And those questions will be sent to me and I'll ask them to whoever they are directed to. We're gonna ask that you, if you can, direct your questions to a specific person or institution That'll help us to get through as many as possible, as opposed to the entire panel, because we have a very large panel. Um, so that's kind of our, our housekeeping and our homework. Uh, I think just in general, I would encourage the audience to take notes if you can. Uh, this is your opportunity to create some receipts if you need to. Everybody who is here is here because they've committed to being a part of this movement and this moment. And so this is the opportunity to, to recognize the work that they're claiming, that they're um, agreeing to do and uh, ask them questions about it and follow up on it beyond this conversation if necessary. Um, for myself, I, I'm a host at the CBC um, and a writer and playwright. Uh, and I'm also very invested in everything that is going on in this moment. I think it's important to recognize that this did not begin with the brutal murder of George Floyd, although a lot of people keep citing that as the inception of this particular moment. Um, this is something that has been going on for generations in this country. It's a fight that's been going on for generations in this country. Um, one of the institutions here and present today is evidence of that fight. Um, they were created as a result of it. And so I want to acknowledge all of the talent that we've lost as a result of all of the systemic issues um, that we're going to be discussing today and thank a lot of the people that have been a part of the struggle for a long time that are no longer here, who are burned out, who are tired, who um, have just went through a little bit too much um, and recognize that by making these changes, we're going to hopefully stem that tide of people leaving the industry and recognize that everybody wins when we uh, make these changes. So that's all that I want to say. I am going to pass it along to our first speaker of the day. Um, from the Academy of Canadian Cinema and Television, I'd like to welcome Beth Jansen. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, I'm assuming you can hear me OK. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Cameron for his leadership in putting this uh, panel together um, and his leadership throughout the years um, at TIFF. Um, uh, I'm really excited to hear from people today and to do some listening. But I did want to um, talk a little bit about what the Academy is doing um, to confront um, these, these issues. Um, I think it's really important that we look inward to see how the Academy has contributed to, these, um, to the current system um, and really understand how we can be the change that we wanna see in the industry. Um, we're going to hear a lot of things. We're going to hear all the right things today. And um, I think it is important that we are held accountable um, and put into practice because that is really what matters. Um, this is about concrete structural changes um, that we can make in our institutions that we can drive that change. Um, and so I think the reason why we're doing this is there is an inner circle in, uh, in Canadian media 
And yes, we want to expand, expand it because it is the right thing. But I also think it is one of the main reasons why our industry has not moved forward um, with as much energy as it could have. Um, because it has been exclusionary and things do need to change. You know, variety of voices will lead to more compelling content. Um, and that's good for everyone. It's good for the industry. It's good for our audiences. Um, so at the Academy, we're working um, under five um, pillars. It's um, staffing, our board, our membership, um, the awards, and then the industry at large. Um, staffing um, is a big one. Um, we are formalizing our hiring process across, um, across the institution. Um, I think that, you know, in our institution and in big institutions, if you leave um, the hiring process sort of up to the individual departments, um, you, you're going to, you're, that's not gonna work in terms of diversifying your workforce. Um, so I really advocate for a formal process to hiring that can circumvent or um, highlight biases on the part of the employer. Um, so I've already gone over my time. So I will say that, um, you know, we're doing all of this work internally and uh, our, our goal is September 24th, we have our AGM. Um, for our members who can um, tune in and we will at that time announce uh, the exact structural plan that we're going to be moving forward with. Thanks so much, Beth. Um, just a note to everybody, you should switch to speaker view because it's probably going to be easier to navigate this entire conversation. Um, I had a specific question for you, Beth. I got an opportunity to look at some of the commitments and the statements that you've made publicly. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the ways that you hope to address not only the concerns of your membership, but also look at the barriers to accessing the academy that may exist for certain communities, whether it be membership dues, submission fees to things like the awards, ticket fees to attend ceremonies. Are those a part of your consideration as we're moving forward? Oh, I think Beth has been muted. Can you unmute her, please? Okay. No, we can't hear. So, um, oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, yeah, that is, uh, we are looking at ways that um, we can address those costs and those as barriers. Um, this year, we gave a rebate of $300 to any, on the submission fee for any um, film that submitted uh, that had an Indigenous director um, at the helm. And that was, you know, by the generosity of a donor. Um, but we don't want to rely on generosity of donors. Um, we want to look at um, formalizing those entry fee reductions um, so that, you know, the awards will be more accessible to those who don't have the resources of a large institution behind them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think absolutely um, we can look at um, tiered systems for um, the other things that we ask um, people to pay for, um, including submission fees, tickets to events, um, that sort of thing. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Beth. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Randy Lennox from Bell Media. Randy, it's, the mic is yours. Oh, no, he's not been unmuted. Can you please unmute Randy Lennox? Am I unmuted? You are. Yay. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Talk to you. Okay. <laughs> um, um, okay, so, you know, you said, Amanda, a moment ago, this started so much before George Floyd, which was May 25th, so we'll call that exactly two months ago. Um, and I, I just want to open by saying the first thing that I did at the end of May, because you may know my background is in music, is I got in touch with artists, Julie Black, Cardinal, and other artists from the BIPOC community that can speak extremely bluntly and extremely freely with me because that's the nature of our history together. And the number one theme they said to me is, Randy, anybody can do this for four weeks. Don't even do this unless you're prepared to commit to the long term. And I really took that on board and said, you know, I started watching big CEOs write big, big checks and make big proclamations. So I made the decision at that point to, to really try and really take that into my heart and think about how we can really affect change in the long term. So the first thing we did was we called Natalie and Judy over at BIPOC. And I said to them, you know, 
how can we help? I, I, first off, I need to understand this more, but how can we help? And, and, and we came up with this database and everybody thought, oh my God, that's what we don't need is another database. However, what we did was we said to BIPOC, and I wanna say it very publicly in front of the people here today, I said, look, Bell Media is prepared to walk the walk of this, Amanda. We're prepared to actually build a proper uh, a, a list in 21 different talent categories of BIPOC and then mandate that the producers that we greenlight utilize that list reflective of the percentage of BIPOC population and in fact LGBTQ population as well. We need to properly mirror the society in which we live. So that was the very first thing we did. And we are building that for August and we're walking the walk of that. And we're asking other broadcasters, Doug Murphy, who runs Chorus, and I spoke last night, he's joining in. I'm, I'm speaking with other broadcasters and other rest squads about trying to centralize this list and then really legitimately have a way folks to monitor. Because anybody can say, okay, we're gonna hire all sorts of people, but we need to have a barometer of where we started and where we're going to move to so we can really legitimately try and increase the BIPOC participation. Just the a note to you, there's only, there's only gonna be, a, uh, you only have a little under a minute left. Oh my God. Well, <laughs> you know I'm not proposed at all, as you know. Um, <laughs> the second thing is, is I said, I wanna have a listening call and every Monday night, Amanda, you've been on it, Cameron's been on it. Every Monday night we draw the community together and I actually don't talk as much as I am now, I listen. And I listen so we can understand how to make content with the sensitivity in mind. And by the way, making sure that, that indigenous folks and people of color and black people, that, that we're, we're not just treating everybody as one group, that we're distinguishing each and being sensitive to each of those groups within the total BIPOC in terms of the onset representation we have, the talent representation we have, and also the Bell Media staff representation. So we've committed now that 40% of all of our new intern and new out of college hires are BIPOC. I'll say that again, 40%. I'm saying that publicly. We have committed that at the executive, we're going to evolve the executive over the next several years to be 25%. And if that moves upwards, great. But these are, these are not numbers that I'm making up for the sake of this call. We are trying to take action as expeditiously and for the long term as we can. I realize I'm out of time, but I will say that this listening call that I've done now seven, seven versions of, and I've sat in on all of them, has taught me more than I've learned in a very, very long time. And I'm hoping that I can be helpful and beneficial in the change that must happen. Thanks, Randy. Um... I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the methods that you're using in terms of the database and the listening calls. Um, there's a reason why so many BIPOC communities are often wary of invitations to consultations, task forces, and research committees. Um, yeah. It's often used as a strategy to quell momentum in a movement. Folks are asked to repeat and prove again traumas that, and experiences that have long been documented. Um, how will you ensure that this is not the destiny of your task force? You've talked a little bit about some of the things that you're hoping to mandate, but can you talk a little bit more about making sure that Bell Media's commitments are not just reactive, but rather policy-driven actions oriented to long-term systemic change that isn't dependent on you, um, but is going to be a part of the entire culture of the organization? It's a great question. So the, the answer is by me saying it publicly, which I've just done, and I have several times, Amanda, as you well know, um, you know, as you know, this bears repeating. We're not fixing this in 15 minutes. This bears repeating. So when I speak, I'm speaking for our entire team. When we finish the BIPOC call every Monday, we subsequently have a call with our entire team telling them A, what we've committed to, B, the fact that they have to adhere to that commitment. Because I'm learning, I can't just say it. And if I get hit by a bus, you're right. Someone needs to be there to make sure that this is executed long-term. So we are rain making the importance of this for everyone within our organization. And may I add also up to Bell, our parent company, so they can be sensitive and understanding and empathetic, most importantly, to the mandate that we're creating. So I also have a history for those that know me of doing what I say I'm going to do. So you can, you can call me anytime you want a year from now 
and ask if I did it. Um, from the audience, could you just please repeat those benchmarks, uh, Randy, for the audience, the, the hiring benchmarks that you mentioned? So effective immediately, 40% of our interns and new out of school hires are from the BIPOC community. And then the longer term, because as you know, we can't fix anything by this Thursday. In the longer term, we want the complexion of our senior ranks to be 25% BIPOC. And is so, there a time, uh, is, has there a time been specified for that longer term goal for your senior executive staff? I mean, BCE, which is my parent company, says 2025. I say that's way too far out, that I want to move much more expeditiously than that. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm sure our audience is going, okay, Randy, I'm eye rolling right now. But the point is, you know, I want to be smart about this, Amanda. And smart mm -hmm. about this is not putting, I'll have it done by August in front of everyone. Because all we do then is derive disappointment. And what I want to do is derive inspiration. And the inspiration will be when I do and then we, well, when we do what we say we're going to do. That will be the okay. inspiration. Well, thank you very much, Randy. Um, I'm going to turn it over again to another broadcaster from the CBC, Catherine Tate. Ka uh, have we got Catherine? I can't actually see her in my view. Catherine is still on mute. Can you please t unmute Catherine? Moderator, could you please unmute Catherine? Catherine, could you turn There we go. There. I, there she I, is. I think, I think that's good. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Cameron. <laughs> thanks, all of my colleagues. And most of all, thanks for all the people who have joined us uh, for this important conversation. Bonjour tout le monde. Um, I want to start by saying this. We at CBC Radio-Canada rec recognize that systemic racism exists in Canada and within many of the institutions um, on this call today, including the National Public Broadcaster. And, um, you know, we, we know we need to combat racism in all its forms, but it's a particularly uh, important um, reality for, uh, for the public broadcaster because we have a unique obligation to offer all Canadians a space where they can make their voices heard and to shape um, our country's future. So um, it's the only way we're going to stay relevant in the lives of all Canadians. So, so for that reason, last year when we launched our new strategic plan, uh, we included a commitment to reflect contemporary Canada in both our workforce and our programming. And, what, and, and that's, a, that's a commitment that we're turning into action and that we've been working on really for the last year to your point that it wasn't just um, uh, sparked by the terrible uh, murder of, of George Floyd. So based on our success in advancing women in the independent production industry and, in, and within the company, uh, last year at BAMP, I announced a new diversity commitment, which was by 2025, at least one of the key creative decision-making positions in all our scripted and factual commission programming programs um, will be held by a person um, from a diverse background. And uh, since um, I would say that we've already made unbelievable progress on that, so I would say that that a uh, goal has been significantly accelerated in the, in the last 18 months. Um, we're bringing a diversity lens to everything we do, uh, to the JSPs, to our training programs. Um, for example, in the recent CBC Creative Relief Fund of the 119 projects funded, 51 came from creators who are Black, Indigenous, or uh, people of color. We, we launched a diversity and inclusion plan back in 2018, which has allowed us to significantly move the needle on our hiring uh, policy and on, on the targets that we set for ourselves. In fact, we surpassed our target last year and um, over a third of our new hires came from uh, BIPOC communities. But we got a long way to go and we know it and we've heard, um, just like, um, like Randy and others on the call, We've been talking to employees um, and, um, and there's a lot of learning and change that has to happen. 
back in November, we formed Sorry, a Catherine, I'm just going to note that you have uh, about 30 seconds left. Ah, <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, there's a ton that we're doing. We are the public broadcaster. It's all online, <laughs> so there's nothing, uh, nothing that isn't uh, public here. But I, I would just say that as the first woman to run the public broadcaster, and that's the first woman in 80 years, I made a commitment at the outset of my mandate uh, to encourage and to promote uh, di the diversity of voices at the public broadcaster. It's our unique advantage and it's our unique obligation and promise uh, to, to Canadians. And so I think we have an incredible opportunity um, to, to make good on this promise. And, and I, if you have questions about the kinds of things we're doing, um, I'm happy to share them. Otherwise, I think there've been a number of public uh, communications on that in the last weeks. Great. Sorry Thank you so much. <laughs> no, that's okay. You were not. No, that's okay. I have mentioned to everyone that they have a very specific time period to speak and that I'm not afraid to cut people off, even if they're my boss. <laughs> but um, Catherine, I just did want to ask a very specific question about the goals in terms of hiring and retention. There are a lot of goals that CBC has stated. Can you talk about how you propose to increase retention for these groups in a context where so many of them are precariously employed, as was noted in the CMG open letter on systemic racism to the CBC? So what, one of the things that our, in, our internal working group has been um, advising uh, senior management on is the, it's one thing to hire and have hiring targets. We've met those, we've exceeded those. Really the issue is how do you retain and how do you advance um, uh, the, uh, the BIPOC uh, employees. And, um, and we heard loud and clear about frustration around all white senior management. So I'm with Randy on, on and transforming senior management, but specifically on setting the goals, we've, we've committed to um, all, let me get this right, a half of all executive and management positions that are posted um, from, uh, from now on will go to um, uh, candidates from either internally or externally from BIPOC uh, communities. So that's a commitment. So you measure it to Randy's point, you got to measure it, you got to pay attention to it. But then you talk about work culture. And, and, and that's, I think you're specifically talking about an issue that we have in a highly unionized environment of temporary workers who are younger, who tend to be a, a high, have a higher degree of representation from BIPOC communities because they are younger and because and, and as a result are more vulnerable. And we're dealing with that in a whole lot of um, ways. One of the ways is that from now on, we've made um, unconscious bias training mandatory for anybody at CBC Radio Canada that's leading anybody. Uh, there's, a, a, there's a bunch of things that we're doing to address, um, address the, the the calls for action from the community. And as I said, we're taking the direction from the diversity and inclusion working group. It's not coming out of my head or the senior team's head. We're really getting their recommendations. And we're kind of on the same time frame as, as Beth in the sense that a lot came in. It wasn't just CMG members or uh, black employees. We've have a, we have a um, a circle that we're going to be um, uh, uh, conducting with Indigenous employees. It's a long process and we want to get it right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure we'll make tons of mistakes, but, mm -hmm. um, but you know, just as a, as a really concrete example, this week we launched a hotline, an anonymous platform for um, uh, Black, Indigenous, or people of color in, that work at the CBC in Radio Canada who want to be able to express uh, their, their witnessing or their experience of racism within the corporation in an anonymous, safe fashion. So that's a way we're kind of responding mm -hmm. in the short term, but there will be longer term change as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you. Um, no problem. I'm now going to turn it over to the Canadian Media Fund uh, with Valerie Creighton. And let me see, can Valerie, is Valerie unmuted? Nope, she is not. Asked him. Got it. There you go. There, there you, you go. go. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, everybody. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this since everything has happened. And one of the questions that Tiff had sent out, and thanks, Cameron, as well, for doing this. You know, do you think we understand as institutions the effects of racism? And I thought, no, we don't. And I think we don't even understand what it actually is. 
You know, when you come from, I'm a white person of privilege, I work in a major institution in the country, and you accept what you've been told and what you've learned and what you've been taught. And in, in Canada, it, it, you know, we've always prided ourselves as a nation of being diverse and people of all cultures come here and are welcome. But it seems lately, we're not all that comfortable with our history of racism in this country and we aren't taught it. So Randy mentioned it, others have mentioned it. There's a lot of listening to do. At the CMF, um, I think listening and, and beyond listening, about in the fall, we set an objectives corporately to start looking at initiatives and launching them for cultural diversity in front of and behind the camera. And then just as we were getting started on that COVID hit, and in a way, it was a good thing because I think, you know, we always consult, we go out to the community. And I think right now consulting is great, but there's a lot of uh, skepticism about consulting and is there really action after that consulting process. So the first step we did take was to invite a, a very a, an extraordinary group of black leaders in both the media industry and from a wider societal perspective to start having a conversation, which we did not lead. We had Karen King lead that. She's well known in the community. And it, um, it's been a very interesting experience, not just about the listening and learning, but about real action that has to be taken. The first thing we did, there was about 20 people. We've had two calls with them in the last three weeks. Um, we had to establish short-term priorities for COVID-19 emergency funding immediately. And so we got their advice and recommendations on how best to go down that road. And then on the longer term, to really take a look at the, the overall policies of the CMF and, and what to do about that. And as I've been listening to people in that group and others and many other people of color in other communities, it's become clear that what people are talking about, you know, there's been systemic racism, there has to be systemic change. I mean, all of the initiatives we talk about have to happen, but it is about a societal shift in thinking and attitude. You can hire all the people you want and you can change your board and that will occur. We're on that cusp. But if we don't change the culture and the way in which people work and operate together in these colonial institutions, It'll be short-lived and I think the real challenge for all of us, I don't think it's going to be easy, I think it's going to be tough, but I think the time is now and the doors are open and if we don't fully embrace this opportunity to make those changes, we'll have lost a tremendous amount as a country and the biggest thing we will have lost is seeing these stories. It's that old, you know, if you can see it, you can be it and if we don't find a way to fully embrace all the conversations that are happening, but turn that into real action, I, I think, you know, it won't be long term. And that's, I think, the real challenge. Um, we learned a lot. We brought the federal agencies and institutions together when, when uh, we started discussing the, the setup of the ISO. And when I look back at that, you know, it, it was a tough road to get everybody to the table and start listening and thinking and learning, but we did it. Jesse will speak about that. I certainly don't need to. Research is important. But one of the things we've learned in these conversations is not everybody is comfortable with certain terminology and language. Some people very much support the BIPOC acronym, others don't. And I think it's really important that we remember it's very distinct, it's very unique, and we can't fall into the trap of just putting everybody in one bucket. So we're looking at that at the CMF. Uh, obviously the short term is really important to get some money out the door. We're looking at long-term change. We uh, paid honorariums to all the people who joined us in this consultation in the Black Leaders Group because it's very important that their time and energy and experience be recognized. And this is broadening now to other, um, other, age, other sorry, associations and individuals and broader people of color. We're looking at staff, the board we don't control, that is done by our funders, which is the Government of Canada. Just to note, you have to about 30 more seconds. Yeah, I'm just about done. Government of Canada and our um, our broadcasting distribution companies, but we can certainly influence and look at our criteria around that. So like others, we're looking at all those pieces, but I think collectively we need to really look at the cultural systemic change. And I think Tanya's research, changing the narrative is a storytelling, and now we have to change the cultures too. I'll just stop there, Amanda, thank you. Thanks so much, Valerie. Um, you talked a little bit about not putting everyone in the same bucket, which uh, made me think about uh, a recent letter to the Minister of Heritage from Black producers and creatives. 
Right. It was noted that the experiences of Black creators is quite distinct and specifically abysmal in this country and that when lumped with other groups, Black creators rarely benefit. Are any of your plans to address this specific disparity considering a stream of committed funds for Black creators? Is that something that you're willing to consider? Yeah, it certainly is. It's come to us as a discussion point from the Black Leaders Group. And you know we haven't resolved that yet. We still have points that we want to go back to them with once we get something kind of sketched out as to what might work. But for sure, I, I don't think we could just do a BIPOC fund for lack of a better word. I think we really have to, as I think someone said, treat this carefully and sincerely and really examine the right way to go about this so that it has a long-term effect and isn't just one place and ghettoized in one place, frankly. I think it has to permeate all the organizations, but yes, we're certainly looking at that. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, Valerie. Thank Just you. a note to everybody, please don't send me questions specifically. You can send them to the tip Q&A. That's how we're going to get to them. And we'll get to them at the end of all of these presentations. So we're going to go through the presentations first, and then we are going to go to the audience Q&A. So going to our next speaker from the Indigenous Screen Office, welcoming Jesse Wenty. Uh, uh, Miigwech, uh, Amanda, thank you so much. And uh, Ani Bojo to everyone watching and Miigwech to uh, TIFF for uh, setting this up. Um, I don't really have a prepared uh, statement as perhaps Amanda alluded to in her introduction. The Indigenous Screen Office is the youngest of the organizations represented on this panel. Uh, we were created in 2017 uh, by the uh, Federal Heritage uh, Minister and started with funds provided by several of the organizations represented on this panel, although I would be clear that uh, we don't report to any of those organizations. We are an independent uh, uh, or organization, a national not-for-profit. So we've only been around for, well, I came on the job as the first employee in February of 2018. So whatever the math is on that, you can, you can figure it out. Um, we are also certainly the smallest of the organizations uh, represented on this panel. And as Amanda said off the top, we were very much formed as a response to the inequity faced by Indigenous creators in Canada's screen system. Inequities that actually have been part of, pointed out in research papers dating back some 20 years. Uh, so the, while we were, were new, the advocacy for uh, an organization like the Indigenous Screen Office has been going on for roughly two two decades, uh, and the needs of which is really was a response to some of the issues that uh, many of these organizations are now talking about. In our, our central focus is on um, narrative sovereignty for Indigenous creators within the Canadian screen sector. Uh, I generally believe that any Indigenous organization has sovereignty as its center, since Indigenous peoples are sovereign uh, on these lands, our nation's uh, should continue to be, uh, have uh, full nationhood and sovereignty. And so we seek it within the, the purview of, the, of a storytelling sector and looking for, for Indigenous control of Indigenous stories throughout that sector from uh, top to bottom. But in response to the current moment uh, that we find ourselves in, um, it, it became quite apparent to us that we could um, help uh, our brothers and sisters um, in the black community in this moment particular by providing what little infrastructure we have uh, to the, that community to help them in this time. So we have already launched in partnership with the Racial Equity Media Collective and BIPOC Film and TV a solidarity fund which the ISO will administer but not actually choose the recipients. Those will be up to those organizations. But since we are a nationally incorporated organization, it's easier for us to provide the flow through and take on the legal uh, liability in dispersing the funds um, for, these, uh, for this community. And that's just the starting. We're seeking further funding uh, for that. And I would just say that as an organization, we uh, came together very early on. I think it was the first staff meeting we had. Uh, and there's, there is only four of us. Uh, so it's not a big staff meeting. Uh, uh, and we came together and, and realized that assisting and using what we can uh, in solidarity with our brothers and sisters and our cousins in the racialized communities is going to be something that we just continue and will, will become as central to us 
um, as anything else. We are, of course, an indigenous organization and we serve indigenous communities, First Nations, Métis, and community, uh, Inuit communities across this land. But that doesn't mean we can't extend uh, in solidarity with other racialized communities in partnership and in collaboration so that we may all learn uh, in this moment. Mm -hmm. And I would just send as a sovereignty seeking organization, uh, I believe in 2020, notions of indigenous sovereignty are deeply entwined with the idea of black liberation. And that is ultimately the goal we're really talking about here. We're talking sectorally specific, but if we really wanted to talk, Amanda, I know you and I would be talking about black liberation and indigenous sovereignty writ large. And these things in 2020 on these lands are un to me inseparable from one another. And thus our communities, you know, all I have to see is the mascots coming down to know how powerful our solidarity can be in this moment and how even the battles that we have fought for so long can be advanced together in a way that they can't necessarily be separately. And so that is my commitment to this ongoing movement, not just this moment. Uh, miigwech, 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 chi miigwech for listening. Thanks so much, Jesse. Um, I didn't know about the Solidarity Fund, so that's wonderful to learn about. Um, various groups have used the Indigenous Screen Office as a model for the kind of advocacy that they would like to have in the industry. Can you talk about the challenges and the opportunities of this model as an institution that was created in response and as a result of institutional failure, but is still somewhat dependent on uh, support and funding from institutions or from the government to exist? Sure. Uh, uh, I mean, that funding part is a real challenge and an ongoing one uh, for us. Um, I'm generally of the belief, and this is what we continue to fight for, a direct allocation from the federal government. Um, I generally believe that those monies are our, are our monies, mm -hmm. and thus I don't see why we shouldn't have our own system to disperse funds for the creation and telling of Indigenous stories uh, on these uh, uh, lands. Um, in terms of some of the challenges and learnings, I think one of the challenges is you know, the ISO and, and, and First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples here have, and it's hard to say that this is, you know, we're going to talk about advantages in this struggle. Uh, I mean, we have to be cautious, but one right. that we do is that we are very specifically named in the Canadian Constitution. And while that is, of course, a deeply flawed document, uh, nonetheless, we exist in there, which means mm -hmm. there's a legal standing that we have that makes it difficult for the, the, even the colonial government to ignore uh, mm -hmm. as much as they may want to. And so that gives us a position to advocate from that is somewhat unique to us and, and uh, allows for a kind of direct advocacy that isn't available to a lot of other racialized, well, isn't to any other racialized communities because mm -hmm. they're not named in that way in the constitution. That said, some of the key things we did I think are beyond that specific positionality in this struggle. Um, namely, you know, and this is advice we've already given to our, our, our cousins in the sector, um, was around data, the importance of data. So I'm encouraged that some of these organizations on this panel who uh, not so long ago said it was a real struggle for them to get data together on racialized uh, peoples um, will now commit to, to that because there's an enormous data gap in Canada. When the ISO started, there was no measurement for the rate of Indigenous productions in Canada. Hmm. There was lots for French and English, but absolutely none for Indigenous peoples. Right. And I would guess, until the recent report that came out, there had been none for Black peoples mm -hmm. either. And so you need data to, to speak to this and real sort of strategies around the advocacy. I don't want to go over too much yeah. over Amanda because we're already way beyond, but I, I, um, we are always there for those uh, conversations uh, with our cousins. Those are the conversations that we get the most joy and, and learn the most from and we hope are the most enjoyable to engage with uh, for our colleagues. And again, miigwech. Thank you, Jesse. Okay, moving on, we are going to the National Film Board of Canada with Claude Jolie -Cleur. And let's see, he is, oh, he's still up. Oh, I think I'm there. You are. I'm there. Yeah. Hi. Hello, everybody. Uh, systemic racism and discrimination are deeply rooted in our society, in our cultural institutions, 
including within the NFB. The NFB is a public producer and distributor It has existed for more than 80 years. And I think the history is shows that how um, that discrimination has been there all the time. Uh, systemic racism is a symbol of small and major injustice lived by too many persons. It's a source of social, cultural, and economic exclusion. It's unfair and unacceptable. As white people, like uh, other mentioned, intellectually we understand what systemic racism is. What we do not understand is the lived experiences of indigenous and racialized people within our institutions and those who are interacting with our institutions. Diversity is paramount in our production at the NFB. Uh, I think over the years, decades, uh, we have been showing that. Last year, 53% of all the works produced at the NFB explore indigenous diversity, disability, and discrimination related issues, a total of 40 films. 16 of those 40 works explore indigenous issues. Those works have been directed and produced by a wide variety of creators from diverse backgrounds. But we also ensure that these films, uh, films that can have an impact on, uh, on the society are widely seen. And uh, we are doing uh, grassroots distribution. We organized a lot of uh, community screening, 8,000 last year. We, uh, we are in, uh, in church basement, libraries, all that, uh, those places where you can see uh, NFB films and also on digital platforms and on televisions. Uh, but if we go back to the roots of uh, racism, our kids are not born racist. They develop it and education can change things. Cinema can contribute to shape a better world and engage a mutual understanding that benefits to all. We have a duty uh, as a as public institution to fight against inequality and racism. We have a duty to act. We have a duty to be leaders in our society. And um, at the NFB, I can say that uh, it, is, it is essential that our employees reflect the diversity of the country. Unfortunately, it's not the case now. And we have a long way to go, but there are bright spots. In 2016, 10% of our staff self-identified as BIPOC. And last March, we brought that number to 15%. But it's still very far from our, what, what our institution should be. In our production division, seven out of our 30 producers or executive producers are BIPOC, approximately a ratio of one in four. Those are the key decision makers working ac across the country, deciding on our programming. So they bring their perspective and personal experience to the works we produce. This is no, a good- You have about 30 more seconds. Yeah. So that's a good start, but we can do better. So by the term, by the end of my term in, in 2022, I want our workforce to be representative of the composition of the country. So recruitment is key. And uh, last month I, I announced that we will have uh, uh, personal for each of our leaders uh, targets to, uh, to, to hire at every step of the organization a variety of uh, diverse uh, employees. We, we are guided also by uh, a very um, uh, active uh, diversity and inclusion uh, committee, and we're currently working on 35 actions. So that's, that's how we, we've moving. We need to be able to um, uh, collect data in a uh, respective way. And I'm calling uh, uh, to our other colleagues institution to work together to have a very respectful way to collect those data. It's essential uh, and each of us can make a difference. Last year we worked with 3,500 different creators, artisans and partners. Each contract can make a difference and, and that's what we are uh, working out at the NFB. Thank you very much. I'm uh, cognizant of the time and some of the limitations, so I'm actually going to stop asking individual questions so that we can have more time for the audience Q&A. So thank you very much, Claude, and I'm going to move on to the next speaker. Thanks. So going to Telefilm, uh, it's Krista Dickinson. 
Thank you, Amanda. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Um, I want to really uh, acknowledge the now amount of people that are actually on this call. There is 800 plus and counting. Uh, and I think it just speaks to the importance of this conversation today. And of course, thank you to Joanna and Cameron from TIFF for organizing this. Um, I think that you're very well aware that telefilm has been the focus of lots of discussion, both in the news and on social media in the last few weeks. So while I think parts of that discussion go hand in hand with today's conversations, I want to be clear that I cannot comment on the employee file that's under investigation. So for those of you wishing for more information on the topic, updates will be provided on our website as they become available. At Telefilm, we are firmly committed to evolving and creating a more representative film community that is inclusive of creators who are Black, Indigenous, people of color, as well as filmmakers from additional underrepresented communities such as LGBTQ2+, and persons with disabilities. Now, that starts with addressing the systemic racism that has existed within organizations like our very own. While we have made strides regarding gender parity, as well as supporting indige indige indigenous creators, we are devoted to continuing to do better with filmmakers from racialized identities and underrepresented communities. Telefilm has been actively working to fix this, and our most comprehensive effort was launched this past Monday in the form of Telefilm's Equity and Representation Action Plan. An overview of the action items that Telefilm is committing to as its first steps in order to help dismantle the systemic racism that has occurred within Canada's film and TV sectors, and really to build a more representative film community within Canada as well as internationally. Now, it builds on previous ongoing conversations and what will be future ones in collaboration with the industry including a diversity and inclusion working group that first convened early in March, right before COVID. So through the action plan, we primarily for, focus on four key areas. The first is changing our policies at Telephone Canada. The second is improving our hiring, staffing, training practices. And that's both in terms of new hires, as well as, as the retention and promotion of current employees. Our third group would be really around the funding um, through the various programs Telefilm has. And then, of course, there's engaging in continuous dialogue with filmmakers and industry members. You'll have seen that I've appointed two current staff members, E.J. Allen and Kathleen Bouget, as the co-leads of our Equity and Representation Action Committee. And they will oversee the action plans rollout. They will add committee members from Telefilm and work with our various external working groups in order to ensure that this is a democratic process and of course, an open dialogue. These rotating dynamic groups of stakeholders are a source of new ideas and feedback into policies and our initiatives. So the action plan is designed to create long lasting, meaningful changes for truthfully what will be the betterment of the industry. Now I recognize- Just a note that you have about 30 seconds. Thank you, Amanda. I want to recognize that this is the very first of many important steps during which there will be moments when I really feel that we will need to pause, to evaluate, to, to learn, and truthfully to, to reassess along the way. So to find our action plan, I'd encourage you to visit our website. Thank you, Amanda. No problem. Thank you very much, Krista. Um, as I mentioned, I'm not going to be asking any follow-up questions to give a little bit more room for the audience Q&A. So we're going to go directly to Tiff and Cameron Bailey. Thank you, Amanda. Am I on? Okay. Yes, Good. you are. Um, I, I'm, I'm grateful to everybody who's taking part today. And especially as I have just looked through some of the over 800 people watching, and I see a lot of people I know, a lot of people who've been working in the screen industries in Canada for years, sometimes decades. And I see a lot of people who don't have institutional jobs. I see a lot of people who actually could be hired if they wanted those jobs and if they 
were ready to commit to what it takes to work within a screen institution in Canada where there is still systemic racism, as I, I'm, I'm glad to hear people have acknowledged. Um, myself, I just want to kind of locate where I'm coming from. Um, I've worked in film in Canada for 33 years. 20 years of those I worked as a freelancer and 13 years within this institution, TIFF, and all of those years as a black man. And that's a position from which um, I'm speaking and from which I work. Um, and as a black leader of an institution who's worked both inside and outside uh, institutions, it gives a kind of a strange perspective sometimes. I also want to acknowledge some history. The conversation we're having today is a conversation um, that has been sparked decades ago. I was myself part of a film community in the late 80s and early 90s that was pushing for access for filmmakers of color and, and indigenous filmmakers within institutions like the Canada Council, the NFB, what's now Ontario Creates. Um, and we were ourselves building on the work of people like Claire Prieto and Roger Buter and Alanisa Bomsawin and Loretta Todd. Um, so this goes back a long way. These issues are not new. And I think that's important to recognize um, as we move on from today's conversation. Uh, the change we're looking to make now has been asked for for decades. Um, and, and I'm glad that we haven't had to deal with some of the conventional wisdom and obstacles, like Canada doesn't have a racism problem, of course it does, but we can't just set quotas, we can. We should recognize, I think, that Canadian content is itself a quota system, and many of our institutions were invented and sustained to support Canadian screen uh, storytelling. Uh, so we're living inside of Canadian quotas already, so we should not be afraid of setting targets and numbers and meeting them when it comes to um, the work of uh, filmmakers who are black, indigenous, or people of color. Um, although we're national institutions, uh, we are working within the cities largely of Toronto and Montreal. 50.2% of the population of Toronto is black, indigenous, or people of color. In Montreal, it's 36.7%. Our staff is largely drawn from those cities, uh, so there's no reason why we shouldn't reflect those cities. Um, and at TIFF, I just want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in terms of staff. We're committing to building a staff that reflects Toronto. Right now, it doesn't fully. Uh, that means we have to look in new places when we're hiring. We have to develop and promote the talent that's already here. And we've got to give people the chance to talk about racism at work so they don't leave. Um, there's a kind of a silent burden that a lot of people carry, and it's, it's what forces people out the door at some point because they just don't have a place to, to speak about what is going on uh, in the workplace. On the programming side, we commit to amplifying a much more inclusive range of work. That means questioning, questioning and expanding the canon uh, of what cinema is. We've done that going back to the days of Planet Africa, to what we've done with Indian cinema at the festival. Now what we need to do is to um, set and meet a target of at least a third of our programming of archival work at the Cinematheque being from Black, uh, Asian, and Indigenous filmmakers, meeting a target at the festival, uh, and in the, our theatrical programming year-round of the same, at least one third. That is the floor, and of course we want to do better whenever we can. Uh, we'll be announcing our festival lineup of only 50 films this year, and, and we have already exceeded that target. Uh, we want to deepen our partnerships with groups like Black Women Film, Imaginative, Black Youth Pathway to Industry, the Real Asian Film Festival, and others. Uh, we know we can't do it alone, and there's expertise uh, within smaller institutions. That's, that's really important. Just a note, you have another 30 seconds. Okay, and then finally, on the audience side, we need to promote what we're doing more. We've done, I think, some important programming that we just weren't able to get to audiences because we didn't have the tools and the means to do it. Uh, and we're not reaching those audiences as we should. So that is the final thing. Um, and we need to get rid of the silence most of all. So I'm glad today is happening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Cameron. Okay, so for those that joined us a little late, just to let you know, this is now the opportunity for the audience to ask questions. Please send them to the TIFF Q&A as opposed to sending them to me. Thanks to that random person that sent me their sizzle reel, but this isn't <laughs> really the time for me to check it out and I don't think I really have the capacity to do much with it anyway. But um, yeah, please send your Q&As to the TIFF or your questions to the TIFF Q&A uh, box and they will send them to me. Um, so I've got the first question here submitted by Julia Palatino, the coordinator of corporate partnerships TIFF. Employee referrals often create very, oh, sorry, actually before I begin with this first question, um, 
for the speakers here, we started 10 minutes late and uh, we just wanted to know if it would be okay for us to go 10 minutes over. Um, if it's not okay, you can send me a message privately and then I'll see if we can get any questions that are specifically for you asked earlier than later. Okay, so submitted by Julia Palatino, coordinator of corporate partnerships TIF. Employee referrals often create barriers and challenges for diversity initiatives. In general, people's networks are composed of people who are similar to them, demographically resulting in quote unquote, like me referrals, where employees refer candidates of the same race, religion, class, et cetera. How are your organizations working to identify barriers such as employee referrals and ensure you are casting a wide enough net to reach a more diverse group of candidates? So this question isn't to a specific organization, but I'm gonna direct it to Claude of NFB because he didn't have to answer one of my questions. Uh, if, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, frankly, I don't know, but I think it should, uh, we should, we should find ways of uh, avoiding those. Uh, the, it's, it's, it's another example of systemic barriers. Uh, how can we uh, make sure that uh, we expand those those reach and avoid that uh, that uh, that possibility? I think also to avoid those uh, circular references, um, the the commitment and the willingness of a potential employee in his behavior and his in his uh, long term uh, uh, career path uh, should talk much more than the uh, previous reference. So. But um, that's something that I will uh, um, deep. Uh, I mean, I, I will uh, I will uh, follow up with my HR just to make sure that we uh, that we are addressing that uh, in appropriate way. Thank you. Um, and again, that was a question to everyone. So although you're not all able to respond to it, I would really ask that all speakers note that question because it's something that I think is addressed for everyone to consider. Uh, the next question is specifically to Tiff. From BIPOC TV and film, how is TIFF ensuring their programming at the reduced virtual festival will represent Black and Indigenous voices? Cameron. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, well, you know, we, we've been thinking and talking about this um, since we began putting the, this year's festival together. I think you'll see when we announce the lineup um, that it uh, more than meets the, the sort of target that I mentioned in terms of at least a third uh, being from those underrepresented communities. Uh, you will have seen, we just announced that we're opening the festival with Spike Lee's new film. Um, and he's really been such a leader in this field, totally fearless in, uh, in addressing some really complicated topics. And this is a film where you see it feels very up to the moment. Um, so, I, you know, I would say just judge us based on what you see uh, and the lineup will be announced shortly. Thank you. Uh, this question is for all the funding bodies and we'll start with Krista since you also didn't have to answer one of my questions. Uh, Race-based data is vital to equity work. How are you all tracking data on BIPOC funding and how many BIPOC companies you work with? Can we get Krista unmuted and maybe I can do it. There we go. Hi. Okay. So yes. Yeah. So data collection is absolutely integral. It is a very, very complex beast, to be perfectly frank, between privacy issues, techno technology, having the rights to be actually capturing that data uh, from a legal perspective in Ottawa for what we're going to do. So um, we have in with the COVID relief top up um, been able for the first time to be able to get data when it comes to underrepresented communities. What I've done moving forward, so that was a very first step, is we're mandating data collection in our, in our program applications moving forward. Um, and what I really understand right now in the conversations I've had in the recent you know, weeks, days, and hours is that absolute need to be able to break it down beyond an umbrella term um, to be to give candidates the opportunity to further identi identify themselves in terms of race so those are things that we we absolutely need to face and we're going to put a plan together on that um, I can't put a time frame on it because it is quite complex but we have begun all this the pieces there's pieces you know, Amanda and, and team, everybody who's on this call, there's pieces that yes, as funding agencies, we control others that we influence and some that we can't control. So it's making sure that all those, those things dovetail together, but we are committed. Thank you for the question. 
you know, problem. And I'm going to pass it on to Valerie as well, too. Sorry, is somebody, did you want to speak? It's code, but, uh, but after Valerie, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Valerie just got up, so maybe you can go ahead. I should? Yes, go ahead. Okay, okay. And we'll okay. get it to Valerie yeah, after. Yeah. I, think, I think we should team up uh, CMF, Telefilm, DNFB, because we are f on, under that federal umbrella or kind of with, uh, with CMF, but we need to create that uh, the same kind of... Uh, uh, procedure and we need to create that safe space where where um, creators and artisans feel safe of uh, identifying themselves so that we can collect data and set up targets be before because without targets that are made on uh, on solid ground it's very hard to uh, to um, to have objectives and uh, and that data is essential so um, I'm, I'm calling Valérie and, uh, and Krista that we, that we team up together to, to find a, a common terminology and a common approach so that we can nationally talk about uh, the, the, the same thing and create that, uh, that environment where people will, will feel that it, they are contributing to something that will advance the, uh, the, the cause of uh, diversity. Thank you, Claude. Uh, Valérie? Yes, uh, absolutely. We often team up on those kinds of initiatives, but I think, you know, data is something that should be collected by and for and with the people who use it. And I, I think we need to find a way to make sure that as the federal institutions, we just don't head down that road on our own. We, you know, we're hoping to talk with, um, certainly as part of the discussion with the Black leaders, the um, uh, other organizations and institutions, the Racial Equity Media Collective is one and there are many others. And I think it's, you know, what I would hate to see is everybody put a lot of time and energy and resources into data independently. And if there is a collective way, Randy's doing a big project that we can connect and we have connected, we've been talking to Bell at the CMF, but just to make sure that we get the strongest possible approach to data but I think it has to be driven by the communities that on which the data is being collected so that we don't go down a direction that doesn't get us the data we need. Because it is, as Krista mentioned, there's lots of barriers and identification issues around data. So I think it's a big job and a really important job and we really can't move ahead without a good solid baseline to start with. Okay, thank you, Valerie. Uh, the next the next question is uh, to Krista at Telefilm. So it's actually a summary from a couple of questions from okay. a few people. Telefilm currently has an Indigenous funding stream, but some people find that this limits Indigenous filmmakers' access to Telefilm's other funding streams and makes them compete for a smaller pot of money. How will you ensure that Indigenous filmmakers have equitable access to funding in comparison with settlers who apply through Telefilm's other funding streams? So, you know, the, the Indigenous, there is there is an envelope of money that's set aside for the Indigenous stream, and that is $4 million annually. However, there is more than that that is being tapped by Indigenous producers, and we certainly are looking for, pro they're, they're not exclusively having to go into that envelope. Um, so, truthfully, there there is greater access in across all the programs as well as that one as well. Okay, so you're saying that that, that particular envelope doesn't preclude people from applying no. for the other? No, okay. not whatsoever. And I don't have the, the figures at the, the tip of my, my fingers. Uh, however, there, it, there is a greater amount of um, funding that takes place for Indigenous productions outside of the stream as well. Well, the fact that that was a question submitted by a few people means maybe that messaging has not been very yeah, clear. I, so that yeah, might well, need to be something. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. We can address yeah. that. That's a good point. Um, uh, da, da. So this is a general question. I'm going to direct it to Randy, who we haven't heard from for a little while. Diverse communities have been advocating for more inclusion for decades and have largely been ignored, allowing the imbalances to continue. Why was that allowed to happen? Why weren't institutions motivated to make significant change before now? I think, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think the best way to approach that is that when you, and I, I'll just speak for the company that I'm in, Bell Media. Um, 
there's probably over 100 decision makers in the hiring process of the company. It's obvious with 7,000 people working at Bell Media that I would not be in the detail on many of those hires. So with that is a lack of education in terms of unconscious bias, in terms of reflecting society, as I said at the very beginning, Amanda. So I think our, I think there's just, it's like not only an unconscious bias, it's an un, just a lack of awareness. And I think um, the first excuse everyone gave me is, well, BIPOC people are, aren't applying for enough jobs, which as you know, is ridiculous, right? And I called it, by the way, as ridiculous. So I don't think there's any excuse um, for having not done it properly. I think probably the best way to approach an answer here is to talk about the fact that in 60 short days, we've probably done about five years worth of learning the awareness level, the fact that it is ricocheting through an organization in, in total bell of over 50,000 people and that we are having really, really wonderful dialogues. And by the way, some of them very uncomfortable, some of them very awkward, and I'm in them, and I'm investing in them. So um, I can only really speak, Amanda, to what we're doing going forward, because frankly, there's no, def there's no defense. <laughs> there's no, you couldn't have credibility and argue that there was any logic before this, because there wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that I'll point to the answer, which is that when you have a hundred different people hiring, they all have their own bias and their own preference. And as someone said earlier, everyone's in their comfort zone. They want to hire people that look like them, that act like them, I because just, uh, it's all comfort can I, zone. Can I just jump so, in for a second? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, look, I think we're all in, in a similar position. Um, for most jobs at TIFF, you'll get over 100 people applying. I'm sure that's the case in, in many other large institutions yeah. as well. But, you know, until you make it a priority, until people are actually assessed on their ability to, to hire inclusively, there's really no incentive, right? Uh, you know, you'll hire who you know or who feels comfortable or, as you said, who looks and feels like you. Uh, and if that's a white person hiring or middle class person hiring or man hiring, then you're going to get that bias replicated every time or nearly every yeah. time. Yeah. So what if, can I, if I can jump in here, there are some real uh, practical public policy um, guidelines here. For example, you don't post a, you don't appoint a person without posting a job. And then you make sure that every board that's looking at hiring a manager, especially that there is representation on that board. I mean, these are very basic HR steps that all of us can take, certainly at the CBC Hydro Canada, this is the commitment we've made, so that you ensure that you, and at the same time, you also invest in a talent pipeline, so that you make sure you have talent acquisition people that are casting as wide a net and are willing to look at people who may not have the exact um, profile that you think you need, so that you- well, I think. I think that brings up a really important point because a lot of the ways job postings are written already becomes exclusionary. So I think that's something to consider as well too. I'm actually going to keep it on you, Catherine, because the next question is for you and Randy. Um, a lot of corporations have patted themselves on the back for gender parity and moving the needle for women. But the reality is that women of color don't see the same kind of gains. For Catherine and Randy, what are CBC and Bell doing to address advancing women of color in various content spaces, levels, and roles? Well, Randy, do you want to go first? I'll answer yep. it. <laughs> so obviously intersectionality is critical. And as, as I said earlier, we have had amazing, uh, we've made amazing progress for women uh, in the industry at large, in CBC in particular, but most importantly in management. I mean, we are um, in, at, at the table at 50%. Uh, we're funding of um, shows with women directors in, in numbers we've never seen before. It's about that commitment, and that now extends to um, other underrepresented groups, whether it be a, a person of color who's female or um, an indigenous woman. I mean, again, these are filters, and I, and I have to say, I just want to, I know these are very, very tough conversations, but when you look at the record of CBC Radio Canada in funding, scripted series from indigenous 
some uh, from uh, Black and from people of color in the last um, two years, we've really, really uh, walked the walk. And, I, and this is going to continue. So it's, again, it's about building positive momentum and believing uh, that there is enormous talent that we haven't tapped into yet and that we want to. Go ahead. So, so I'll, I'll answer your question. And that is, um, we're going to need to do better. You know, if I take transplant, which is our latest show, it's 62% BIPOC, 62%. But was that a quota? No. Was that just the nature of the show? It worked out. But I have 10 other examples that don't comply with that. So I, I think we just need to do better. I don't, I don't think there's, I couldn't pretend to answer that question because we haven't done good enough. Have we done better? Have I gone at Bell Media from 32 to 46%? Women, yes. Ha has there been a, a, a distribution or a conversation about uh, black women within that number? Yes. Can I quantify that? No. So I, I think under the category of there is no perfect answer to that question, I think we're going to have to meet again and we're going to have to just, we're saying the same thing. We have to monitor our improvements and make them and make sure that we, we are accountable 6, 12, 18 months from now. And I think we should meet again. Um, I think meeting again is great. And I also think that for all of these questions, I hope you guys are noting them because these are the questions from community that clearly don't seem to have clear responses or answers from what they've been observing of every institution. This yeah. question is um, not to anybody directly. So I'm going to allow anyone who feels compelled to answer it. It's a great question. Submitted by Rita Deverell, producer and in arts grants. What changes are you making for mature to senior BIPOC creators? If the playing field levels for emerging artists, that is terrific. However, senior slash elder artists have an accumulated racism deficit and organizations have on the whole missed their wisdom. What are your plans for changing the roadblocked careers that some of us have experienced for 30 to 40 to 50 years and indeed benefiting from our experiences? Who wants to answer that one? I guess I think Cam I think Cam I think Cameron was about to start speaking. Okay, Cameron, I beg your pardon. Go ahead. Um, we're we're a presenting organization. We don't fund production, so at that part of Rita's question, I can't answer. Um, but I, I think what what I can say that I think affects all of us as institutions is something you uh, alluded to earlier, Amanda, which is that people burn out. Uh, they get tired, uh, people of color, indigenous people, black people in institutions, and they leave. Uh, they, they'll start to work independently or they might just give up and move on to something else because there is that accumulated racism deficit, as, as you mentioned, Rita. And I think that's really important to address for all of us, whether it's somebody who's looking to make a film, tell a story, or get their story seen. Uh, I think we have to address the fact that people feel like they have been banging their heads against a wall and the wall is us. It's the institutions and we need to change that. I'm um, sorry, I just got a clarification that Rita would specifically very much also like to hear from Valerie on that question. Um, Valerie, let me know if you need the question repeated. Am I there? Yes. Yeah. I think, you know, Rita, your points are well taken and I guess the question about should there be something specific, I don't have an answer for that, but I think everything has to change and it has to be open. Whatever change is made and whatever change is made at a program level across the board shouldn't have any barriers for age or people's experience and careers. I, I can just tell you that we brought some very young people into the Black Leaders Group, some very senior people into the Black Leaders Group some people who were elders that were outside of our media industry and the dialogue was fantastic because it was such a it was an eclectic group of various ages and experience levels and stories so whatever happens and however this change occurs it can't be defined and i think there has to be on the same hand recognition of the kind of experience as you say and you know it's these institutions who are lacking in not taking um embracing wholly the kind of experience of people who are have had a lot a long career in this industry and bang their head against these various walls for many many times i'll just say good thing you're still here because that's going to come into a, into a very important play i think as this whole thing unfolds i just mm -hmm. wanted to add amanda i think you know struggling with why this people 
you know, this issue of hiring and quotas and all the rest of that, it's also at the CMF, what we also see is people in media, you know, we don't, we don't fund, we fund, but we don't trigger the projects. And I think people work with who they know, you know, it's just a natural human evolution. You work with the same people over and over again because you know them, you trust them. And I don't think that's going to hold anymore. It just, it's not going to hold. And the whole system is on the verge of collapse around that. So people are out there. I remember a producer and a broadcaster telling me, well, there are no good women directors. Well, clearly that has not been the case. And you're right about, you know, the gender thing has been quite successful, but women of color still, the stats aren't there. So this whole thing has to have a huge shift on many, many, many ways. And the media industry, we're the media industry. We should be able to find ways to break these barriers and ensure these stories are told because it's the Canadian public that's disadvantaged from not having these stories available to them at the, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to direct this question to Jesse, submitted by a professor and program coordinator. How do these organizations or institutions envision working with the film schools to address systemic racism and sexism in the industry? Where's Jesse? Oh, here, there you are. Let me let me try to unmute you. There you there you go. Thank you. Um, that's a great question, and one at the ISO we have not gotten to. Uh, yet in our limited existence and limited uh, resources. Um, certainly, I think it's, it's key in that, um, whether it's uh, colleges that are training, you know, below the line uh, creatives or above the line, or quite frankly, executives, curators, uh, you know, all of those different uh, positions, we don't have nearly enough representation um, in those things and so we do need uh to see a more coordinated uh effort i wish i had a better answer for you i wish uh this was a higher priority um it we're not there yet we've been we've been struggling to do a whole bunch of things and that just hasn't uh, been there yet but it is on the list that's mm -hmm. that's probably the best uh i i can say and that um we do we have we do have a partnership actually with uh, MIT uh, on uh, interactive and sort of new media uh, projects for very senior level uh, um, folks um, that just happened uh, virtually, of course. So we have engaged with some um, post-secondary institutions, but we haven't gone all the way. And again, we are a, uh, a company of four people um, so it, it's on the list, but, but uh, we will get there. And if any of university folks are listening, you can always reach out to us because that would make it much easier. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, submitted by filmmaker Lena Rodriguez, a question for Krista at Telefilm. Can you provide details about how you plan to make the funding process more transparent? It's still not clear how projects are selected in general. Yeah, we're we're looking at the the entire process um, and from publicate being public about our funding decisions. Um, we're very transparent about when are the when the programs are open. Uh, we're reviewing the process. I think that you're going to see more and more of that information. It's becoming apparent to us that that needs to be more evident on our website. So we're going to be way more proactive in thinking about um, that versus just going to say, hey, go to our guidelines. I think that, you know, that concept of being, oh, it's in the guidelines is, is just not good enough. And, and we understand that. Um, while I have the mic, may I take advantage to just go back to the, the, the question you had on, um, excuse me, the, the, the Indigenous funding. So I have been able to pull up some greater information. So for instance, for the fiscal year 2019-20, where we did fund $4.3 million of projects within the Indigenous stream, we also funded Five million in addition to that, that was allocated to projects from Indigenous creators through Telephone's main development and production programs. Um, so that really is, you know, over nine million dollars in one year. Okay, thank you very much for that information. Um, oops, sorry, yes. let me just see. Some, there's so many things here. Okay, 
submitted by Wes Hall, Executive Chairman and Founder, Kingsdale Advisors. Can you confirm if you or your organization have signed the Black North Initiative CEO pledge that over 220 Canadian CEOs signed to end anti-Black systemic racism? And if not, why not? Do you believe it should be a condition of receiving public funding for you to sign a pledge that you are against anti-Black systemic racism? So this I'm assuming is a question for everybody. Um, it's going to take a long time for everyone to respond. So Cameron, I'll start with you. Since yeah, I heard first. Wes, thank you for the question. Uh, Wes Hall is a business leader and a member of our board as well. And he's launched this uh, really great new initiative to uh, get the leaders of organizations and companies in Canada uh, to commit uh, to addressing anti-Black racism and racism generally. Um, we have not yet signed that pledge, Wes, and I, I think uh, the uh, other uh, people on this call uh, haven't yet either. Uh, this is something I think we should be paying attention to, so uh, it's something I would encourage everybody to just have a look at. It's just uh, come out. There was a, a conference online just, I think, on the weekend, um, so it's fairly new to us, but it's something we should be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to add to that? So or it's that... Krista speaking from yeah. Telefilm. Mm -hmm. um, we were invited to participate as well to sign the pledge and um, I'm very interested um, in doing so. There's a couple pieces that basically hold us back a little bit. One, for instance, is around the board composition. That's not in my purview. I can't can commit to something that belongs to the Privy Council of Canada. So we have to kind of work through some of those things. Okay. Uh, um, Amanda, I'll yeah. address. Um, I have a call at 8.30 Friday morning because I'm not aware of the criteria. It's not been put in front of me, so I've asked to see it, and that call is day after tomorrow. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, this was submitted by Anonymous. Many emerging Indigenous, Black, and artists of color are not being given starting opportunities from smaller institutions to build a strong enough resume to get big opportunities with you. Do you have a plan to address that gap and fulfill your pledges? And I would just like to maybe connect this question to some of the conversation that was starting around hiring uh, processes and, and some of the job descriptions that might not be completely inclusive. So I know Catherine was starting to talk about that in public policy responses. So maybe you could take this question. I think at the um, I think it's extremely important for uh, especially the broadcasters because we have very the, uh, Randy and I have probably the largest workforce um, in, right on this call uh, with 7,500 employees. We have, uh, in my opinion, a moral obligation to make sure that everybody gets a, a crack at uh, new op the opportunities that come up uh, within our organization. So as I said earlier, we formalized it. There is no hiring anybody without going through a process. And, you know, people can complain about the CBC being really bureaucratic. Yeah, this is going to be bureaucratic. It's going to be heavy. It means that you, you may have to go through a process. If you don't find a board that is suitably representative, we send you back. You've got to start again. You've got to find people of color, of in, uh, uh, Black employees or Indigenous employees, picking and selecting and being a part of that new um, hiring process. And, it's going to be it's going to be a little heavy at the beginning. Um, it's going to be hard on some of our employees because they get asked over and over again to be on these boards. But that's the only way we're going to start casting a wider net uh, than what we have right now. Just on that on that question that came about the universities. Again, our larger organizations like ours can work with universities. We are in, uh, for example, on the francophone side, we have a program uh, called Synergie that works very directly with universities to identify talent from diverse backgrounds to start um, uh, training and making sure they get into uh, our system, either on the journalism side or on the independent production side. So this has been a huge commitment for us. Similarly, we have internships and programs on the English side um, to try to bring in uh, more um, uh, people from across the, across the entire um, spectrum. So again, it's really, we're very privileged, obviously, as a public broadcaster, it is our mandate when we talked about how do you make sure that, that people follow up on this action plan, it's in our mandate. We have to serve Indigenous people. We have to serve all 
Canadians. That's not just white Canadians, that's everybody. And, and I take that very seriously and our senior management team takes that very seriously. Um, and we've done pretty well on, on in certain areas, but there's loads of room for improvement. Um, and, I, and I just want to go back to the actual question because I'm not sure sorry. if in me adding to it, I might have met, kind of jumbled in. I want to make sure that it actually gets answered. So the question was specifically about uh, emerging, emerging Indigenous Black and artists of color not being given starting opportunities from smaller institutions to build a strong oh, enough sorry. resume to get to the big opportunities with institutions like the CBC. So do you have a plan to address that gap and fulfill your pledges? So perhaps their resume might not end up looking as impressive as some others, but can we recognize other types of experiences? You know, I'm going to just re relate this to my own life experience. Every job I ever had was a stretch. Somebody, and often it was a white man, um, took a chance on me. And we have to start um, bringing that kind of um, stretch opportunity thinking into everything we do. So. For the, certainly, um, we all know how those how those networks work. Oh, you you know you're a, a parent or a friend of a parent, whatever knows somebody and gets you that first internship and it builds your resume. It's about mentoring. It's about being a sponsor. Uh, we have a program within CBC that we're now extending to the entire company called the uh, the Diverse Emerging Leaders Program, where we identify people. People put their hands up. We identify people that we believe need more exposure so they can build their resumes. It's exactly that, get more exposure, build your resume. On the small, again, all I can say is on the, it's, um, it's about a shift in openness and a shift in attention. And each of us on the call here has an opportunity to mentor or to sponsor someone who's trying to break into the, into the business at any level. Amanda. Thank you, uh, sorry, yeah. Just wanted to <clears throat> add concretely one of the um, things we just initiatives we just announced with Netflix and the National Bank through um, <clears throat> excuse me Fabian Colas Foundation being Black in Canada is exactly that mentorship and training and getting I, I haven't got the stats right in front of me but there's a significant number of emerging individuals in Toronto Montreal and Halifax is my understanding that have now come into that and so that I don't have a lot of detail on it because I've been off all week. But that is one of the things I think that's a concrete step that is okay. involving um, leadership from all of those organizations. Yeah. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, at the NFB last year, 51% of our projects were directed by emerging filmmakers, so pre-professional uh, films or less. So mm -hmm. we have that place as well in our diverse uh, range of creatives. I'll just say this was one of the questions that I was I wanted to ask, but I didn't get to, and I'm not going to ask, I'm just going to throw it out there, is that making sure that when those opportunities come about, that we you're also cognizant of the fact that sometimes those opportunities only happen within certain parameters or limited parameters. So maybe it's only going to be a short film as opposed to an opportunity for a feature. Maybe it's only going to get certain kinds of resources and allocation, funding, distribution, and marketing that other bigger things don't. So making sure that those disparities are also considered as you're doing this type of work. I'm going to go on and I'm going to actually direct this question to Beth. I know we haven't gotten to hear from Beth for a little while. What steps are being taken to address bullying and racism in each organization when it comes from a superior? And just noting the time, we might have one more question after this. Beth, are you still with us? Yeah, sorry, can you say okay. what and racism? What steps are being taken to address bullying and racism in each organization when it comes from a superior? Oh, um, uh, we, I think uh, putting a reporting process in place is, is really important. Um, but I think, you know, the truth is that um, bullying and racism has been a part of um, this industry for so long that it's really become very normalized. Um, so, I think it would be great if we could put systems in place, but I just, um, I, I don't know, I don't know what this, what the solution is for that. Um, I'm sorry, I can't be more. That's okay. Does anybody else <laughs> want to jump, jump in on that? If, if, if you have a, yes, if you have to have a whistleblower system, you have to allow people to have a safe place to communicate whether they've witnessed a, a racist act or a, a microaggression or whether they've lived the experience, they have to have a place where they can communicate that complaint 
anonymously, and then you need a process um, to respond to that, and there needs to be accountability. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, and again, I, I, I speak um, passionately about this subject because this is something that I have learned from our Black employees over the last weeks about the feeling, and it's why we moved so quickly to get a, a hotline in place because they didn't feel safe uh, talking to the HR people or talking to me or talking to their superior or their manager. So I think really that's a very key practical uh, tool that can be used. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a full-time person that you hire internally. There's, there are people uh, that do this for a living and, it, and they're professionals and they know how to handle uh, anti-discrimination and harassment complaints. Can I just add one quick thing? Mm -hmm. um, I would just say uh, racist comments, bullying comments happen in every workplace all the time. Screen organizations aren't immune to that. But one of the things that often happens is that when a racialized person says something is racist, someone who is white will say, no, it's not, or they'll challenge it, or they'll try to tell you why it's not racist. Let's please all encourage our staffs to stop doing that, right? That should just never happen. Uh, and I if people feel free to comment when something has had a racist impact on them, the job is just to listen. That's all, and respond. Thank you, and it Jesse. Be I'm sorry, I, Amanda. Yeah, oh, sorry, Jesse. I realized that you wanted to respond to a question earlier, and I didn't get to it. There's, the next question is also directed to you, to you. So, do you want me to read that question, then you can respond to both at the same time, Jesse? Sure, that will challenge my memory, but I'll let's give it a go. <laughs> okay. A uh, summarized question submitted by Norman Champagne, Indigenous filmmaker. This question was directed to Jesse Wente. One of the biggest problems for Indigenous filmmakers is access to talent. Unions minimum budget requirements can make it difficult for micro budget filmmakers to pay talent. What can be done and by whom to ensure unions like ACTRA make their policies more accessible for Indigenous filmmakers working with micro budgets? And I can definitely say as somebody who tried to make a short film that's shared across the board. And then if you wanted to also respond to the other question as well too. Sure, I, you know, that it's a, it's a good question and it's an ongoing challenge and one we've heard a lot of. We, we have had discussions with um, the unions and ACTRA around exemptions and policies around. It is possible, but it, it's, um, it's a long, game, um, but it is absolutely an, a, an issue we're aware of. We're also aware, you know, that if you want to assemble an Indigenous crew, uh, that may be hard given the tax credits and the way they are regionally located. There's a whole bunch of these sorts of uh, barriers that exist within the system uh, to participation, and we are, we are advocating on, on uh, all fronts, and that is certainly one that we've, uh, is an ongoing discussion. Uh, with the unions, absolutely. And that is, I think, really where it has to uh, happen because those smaller budget um, teams want to access union talent. And frankly, the union talent often wants to work on those projects because they are meaningful and important. So uh, mm -hmm. there's a compromise that obviously can be reached when that's the situation. And we're working on it. Did you want to go back to the other question? Yes, the one other thing I wanted to mention um, when we're talking about process is that the uh, Indigenous Screen Office in partnership with Imaginative, one of the initiatives we have been able to accomplish uh, in, our, in our short time was to release a document called the Protocols and Pathways for Screen Production. You can find this on the iso-bea.ca website. It is a document about right relations when you are going to tell Indigenous stories, but it is a broad enough document that can, it can apply because it's central ideas of respect, reciprocity, consent, collaboration are actually universal for large dominant players when they enter any marginalized community. There should be a process to what it means. And on hiring, one thing I'll quickly say, Amanda, is one of the challenges organizations have when it comes to hiring uh, people from diverse communities is that they don't have relationships with those communities to begin with. And when you don't actually have those relationships, your organization will not be seen as a destination for that community, whether it's as a client or as an employee or a leader. And you have to or build Or as an those, audience. Or as an audience. And you have to build those relationships, not in moments of crisis, when you are asking for something from that community. You have to be with that community and build that relationship all the time, ongoing, every day. And that will actually yield you the results on a hiring once you've 
invested in that relationship in the long term. You're always there, not just when you need something. That's what actually get more success on the people that enter you. And that community will then view your organization as a place it wants to be and a safe place for it to be. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Jesse. We have gone over our time by three minutes. So I just want to close it there. We, I just want to note that there are 12 pages of questions that have been submitted to the TIFF folks. So there's clearly a lot that we did not get to. Um, it's worth telling you that TIFF will pull out the common themes and send all of those questions to speakers after the meeting and follow up with responses. So they've committed to doing that. Um, as Randy suggested, this might be the first of many conversations to come. We shall see. Uh, it also should be known that almost all of the institutions shared with me some of their public statements uh, around their commitments uh, around this issue. And so those can be found as well too. Perhaps TIFF can compile them in some ways so that you can see all of those public statements in one place so that you can figure out all of those uh, receipts that you need when you want to respond to folks in different ways. I want to thank everyone for participating in this conversation from the folks that are here as our featured speakers and to our audience members for being here. This is a conversation that is definitely overdue, has been uh, one that has been a part of many different communities for a really long time. And so I'm glad that the leaders of these institutions have agreed to be a part of it and, and to make some serious structural changes. And we will be holding you all to account with all of them as well too. Um, thank you again to TIFF for organizing and pulling this all together um, and to all the people unseen that you cannot see who have been working really hard at their keyboards trying to make this coherent and organized. Um, and thank you all for making the time to be here. And Amanda, thank you. Really appreciate it. And thanks to everyone who took part today. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, no problem. Amanda. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci.